Hello everyone and welcome to the third episode of the Disclosure Podcast. I am your host Ed and today's podcast is going to be different to the first two because on today's podcast um, I am joined by a guest. Uh, My guest is a, a gentleman called Mark. He lives in the UK and he was a farmer and he was raised on dairy and sheep farms and he was actively involved in the farming process um, himself as a farmer for 21 years Um, and he wants to share some of his experiences today. Mark actually reached out to me via email and said that he wanted to talk about his experiences, that he felt that he had an obligation almost to talk about it and he and he discusses this in the podcast as well so I, I i won't take words out of mark's mouth i'll let him speak for himself in that sense but he was expressing the fact that he'd seen land of hope and glory the the documentary that i co-created in 2017 and it brought back i think a lot of memories for him and he just wanted to have a platform from which to discuss his experiences and so you know we were chatting over email a little bit and i asked if he wanted to appear on the podcast to talk about those experiences so that's what we have today Um, Mark's family is still involved in the farming industries a lot of the people that Mark grew up around you know people that maybe he considered friends but at the very least he he knew from a very young age are also still actively involved within the animal farming industries as well however Mark turned his back on the farming industries and he is now a vegan and he has a vegan family and he's very passionate about his veganism And so I just want the podcast to be a way of him having the opportunity to share his experiences. I think what's happening a lot or what we've seen, you know, with documentaries such as 73 Cows, the BAFTA award winning documentary about the farmer Jay Wilde who donated his cows to Hillside Animal Sanctuary so they could live freely and now runs a veganic farm instead of an animal farm. We're seeing people like that, they get a lot of exposure, but I think it almost suggests that these cases are somewhat isolated that you know most farmers don't change or are always involved in the industries and i think what i quite like with this podcast not only today's episode but hopefully future episodes as well is to show that actually there are a number of farmers who have turned their back on the industry who may be vegan who don't feel like they can who feel like they want to talk about what happened but maybe don't feel like they have the option to or the capability to And so I I want Mark's story for all of my listeners to be a story of hope, of showing that anyone can come from any background and be involved in any practice, but still come out of it a different person at the end. And just because people are raised doing horrible things on farms and accept it as being normal at the time and don't really question at the time, that doesn't mean that they won't change in future. I think Mark's story is, is a signifier that anyone has the capacity to change. Um, and we should always give people the benefit of the doubt to understand that they can change no matter what it is that they've done in you know their previous years of life as farmers or slaughterhouse workers or whatever capacity they have involved in the industry so i want mark's story to be a story of hope but i also want it for for mark personally him him, for him to be a, a way of a way of him being able to convey the message that otherwise he wouldn't be able to do i do want to say at the beginning that there are some descriptors of some not very nice things happening to animals some that you may already know about and some that you may already be aware of that happen to animals but also some that maybe you you didn't know about before from my conversation with mark um, i learned a lot and i well some of the things i learned are really horrible things Um, and so i do want to give a little disclaimer at the beginning to say that the conversation is important and I think that we should be aware of these things, but I'm not going to lie to you and say that it's pleasant. But I want to say a special thank you to Mark now at the beginning before we begin. Thank you for, for talking about these experiences. Thank you for being brave enough to talk about them. I know that it must be difficult for you to do so. And I know that from what you've expressed to me that there are some feelings there that probably are not that pleasant. So I can appreciate that that making them vocal and, and talking about them out loud and allowing other people to hear about the things that you were involved in is probably not the necessarily the easiest thing you've ever done. So before we start, Mark, if you're listening to this at the beginning, I just want to say thank you so much. And um, for the rest of you, if I've got listeners here who aren't vegan, please do listen and please do do hear Mark's stories. Mark was raised as a farmer and, and has lots of stories to tell. Um, so please do listen to them and then do your own research as well and, and look into it and see what you find out and see 
if what you find out about other experiences and other practices, what's legally condoned and, and indeed what isn't, if that, if that correlates to Mark's story, then please take it with that truth and look at your actions and, and let's see if we can change to make this world a better place. And for those of you listening who are already vegans, use what we talk about today to maybe channel, fuel, inspire, whatever whatever word you want to use. Just use it to encourage yourself to speak up and advocate and, you know, act on behalf of the animals who need us to act on behalf of them. So, but I'm going to stop talking now, this little introduction. Thank you for joining the third podcast. And without further ado, let me introduce the interview with Mark. So joining me in the podcast now is Mark, who grew up on several different farms in Lincolnshire. And Mark has kindly joined me on the podcast today to talk about some of his experiences and discuss some of the things he's seen, but also to kind of give a, a broader idea of, of what he thinks the farming mentality is like. Um, and we can have a discussion about some of those ideas as well. So, Mark, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. No, it's it's no worries. I, uh, I appreciate you letting me come on and share my, no, uh, um, share my stories. Yeah, and what, just for a bit of context, Mark reached out to me via email and said that he had a couple of things that he was interested in discussing. Um, and so I, I replied and was like, well, I'd love to have you on the podcast. It'd be great to talk about some of these things. I think what it... You know, what we've seen recently is there's been a few farmers that have donated their animals to sanctuaries and um, they've kind of got a bit of media attention. But I think what we often overlook is there are a lot of people that worked on farms at some point in their life or who were raised on farms who have a lot of stories to tell, but don't always have the means in which to tell those stories. And so um, I hope that maybe through the podcast today, we can have a, a bit of a discussion and maybe you have a chance to talk about some of those experiences as well. Um, so, Mark, j- just to begin, could you maybe give a little overview of, of kind of what farms you worked on when you were growing up? Uh, I've worked on <clears throat> dairy farms mainly with sheep and uh, also beef farms. Uh, so it's beef and dairy, really the beef and dairy industry I've, I grew up in uh, and I've worked in them up to a, a certain age and then I, uh, I, I left the industry. And uh, at what age was it from when you were very young that you started working on these farms? I started, yeah, I, w- I was brought up on one from being uh you know i, I was born uh, and raised uh, a farmer's son so it's from the beginning up to being about 20 21 when i got out but uh, i worked on a, a quite a few different farms um i I'd experienced lots of things on my friends farms and and things like that so i have one or two stories that i think uh might help people to realize uh what the farming industry is about really ed and uh yeah, and when you say what the farming industry is really is really about, could you maybe describe a little bit more about that? Because obviously, in the UK, there's so many ideals of what farming is. And I was wondering, what, well, what do you think that farming far- is? Farming, uh, really. To before I start the story, what you what you really need to understand it, for it to make any sense at all is that farming is a, about pounds and pence, and animals are assets. Everything else. Uh, is a liability. So the only assets really on a farm, on a say, say we take an, a, a dairy farm for instance, uh, the cows are the assets on the dairy farm. Everything else is a liability. But there's a pivot point of when an asset becomes a liability. There's only so much uh, farm, farming work on a small profit mar- margin per animal so if you, if you look at that if it's a small profit margin per animal you that's why you get the intense farming because you can't make money out of 20 30 dairy cows as you used to be able to in the old days now it's got to be hundreds of dairy cows and when you've got hundreds of dairy cows to make the profit that you want is they're just they're just assets they're not animals to the farmers farmers don't look at their cows or their sheep or their pigs, or their uh, other animals uh, that they make money out of as animal as animals. They're assets. So maybe you've got to understand that to understand the farming uh, lifestyle, which it is a lifestyle. 
It absolutely is. And do you think that to farmers, obviously, that they have somewhat of a, a disconnect, I guess. They're not necessarily viewing the animals on their farms as, as being individuals. Do you think that's maybe a psychological thing to make some of the, the tasks they perform easier for, for them psychologically? Or do you think it's just the way they're raised and it's just kind of... It's, it's, a, way, it's, a, it's a way they've raised... It, it's a way a farmer is raised. It's, a, it's just a, it's, it's a way of life. You're brought up with animals. Uh, you've got to make a living out of them. So the animals are uh, basically just an asset, an asset. It's, it's pounds and pence, and this is what you've got to realise to to understand the, the farming industry. Absolutely. So when we say it's, it's pounds and pence, I guess what we mean is that the farmers will, will often cut corners or, or they'll do whatever is required to make sure they're turning over something that resembles yeah. you know, a livable profit. That's completely true, Ed. The farming industry runs on small profits. I mean, the for for milk industry, they're they're only getting paid same as they did maybe twenty years ago. But everything else has gone up. So who suffers? It, it's the animal that suffers. If they're ill, uh, do you get the vet? It's going to cost so much because vets bills don't stay the same. They've gone up. They're expensive. Uh, my my experiences uh, as a as a child growing up, for instance, uh, I remember one time we were down the fields. A sheep was lambing, its lamb bed had all come out, the lambs were dead, the sheep was dying. Uh, my dad sent me up the field to get a metal bar. He got a metal bar and he killed that sheep with a metal bar through its head, which took a long time to do because the sheep's head is very hard. So it's things things like that. I mean, could he have got the vet? Would the vet have put it down? It had cost him a fortune. The sheep were only worth about £30, £40 at the time. The vet bill would have been more than that. A metal bar through the head. It wasn't nice to watch. Uh, I still remember it to this day. Another instance on on a on a farm that I was on, we had difficult difficulty carving a cow because the cow had been bulled to what was a Belgian blue blue bull. It was a smallish, yeah. you know, it was a dairy cow. The uh, it, it was bull and the Belgian blue cow bull is. Uh, very stocky, so the calves come out stocky. So it couldn't carve this, yeah. but we wanted to get the calf out. So two strings on to, onto its feet that were poking out of the back of the cow, couldn't move it, so it was hooked up to the back of the tractor uh, and pulled out. Uh, of course, this damaged the calf uh, and this damaged the cow. The calf didn't live. Yeah, right. So it's things like that that I remember distinctly. Uh, and these so, things happen in farming, and it's cruel. Absolutely. The cow was in a lot of pain. It, it, at the end, it didn't live. It didn't get put down. When a cow's knacker, as you might say, they get the knacker man in, which is a man who comes and takes the, the dead and dying cows away. Uh, I remember this particular one. Of course, we dragged it out of the loose box again. It was just an ordinary cattle wagon with a winch in. The cow was still alive. We, there was a wire on the end of the winch that fastened to one leg, just one leg, dragged it up. Uh, of course, it caught on the tailgate, and uh, I remember shouting to the the chap, "No, no, its legs stuck." Uh, but he just, "It'd be right, lad." Carried it on, dragged it up. It broke that leg. The cow were mooing out in pain, and that was just dragged in the back of the wagon. We never saw that again. And it's uh, it, out of mind, out of sight, out of mind sort of thing. So that these are the kind of re- these are the things that's uh, helped me to go vegan today. This is, these are the kind of things that helped me to get out of farming. And these are the kind of things that I'd like people to know actually happen on farms. And what I'm telling you is only going to be the truth. I'm not going to make mm-hmm. anything up. Uh, I'm not saying that farmers are not compassionate because they'll have the little Jack Russell sat by their auger. They'll cuddle it and be kind to it and stuff like that. You know, but if you, where me and you will probably see little lambs skipping in the spring in the fields and think, oh, they're cute. Look at that. What a lovely. They don't see lambs as, as cute. They see lambs as, oh, they're good lambs, they're, they should make me a bit of money. And that's just the yeah. mentality that it's not, it's just a business. Farming's a business and animals are assets. And it's as simple as that. On, on and that when you one, think Ed. back about, when you think back about those experiences there, let, let's talk about the lamb one that you first described. How old were you when you saw that? Eight, about eight years old. Eight. And, and, and when you think about it now, how does it make you feel? It makes me feel. Uh, it makes me feel terrible. Well, yeah. when I say terrible, it makes me feel bad because 
isn't that weren't the only only thing that I, I'd seen. I'd, I'd seen that, but it was quite normal for me at the time. Uh, mm. It was distressing, but it was normal. I'd, I'd seen things. You know, death is death's part of farming. Animal deaths, are, it's part of farming, and that had put me dad in a bad mood for for weeks. Not because he missed the animal or I'd, whether he felt bad about the animal. I don't know. I never asked him. He, he was a tough no. sort of guy. We didn't talk about stuff like that. But it, it was a loss for him. I remember one instance, a cow falling into the slurry pit. We had a, a, a large slurry pit. It swum, it kind of staggered its way out towards the middle of the slurry pit. But there's a crust on top of the, on top of the slurry, which is cow, cow muck and wee and manure. And if anybody didn't know what slurry is out there. Uh, yeah. We put plywood sheets on. I had the job of going across with a rope, putting it around the cow's neck on these plywood sheets and again dragged it out with a tractor. But of course, it was a lip, uh, maybe a three foot lip. And we tried and tried to get that cow out. And uh, at the end, we did get it out. It was alive. And then it, it just died there. And then when I took the rope off its neck, it, it just died there and then. So that was another uh, instance of things that happen on farms and how. You know, I mean, I can't, can't say any other way he would have got it out. Uh, if we'd have got a vet, what could he have done? He'd have just told us yeah. to do the same thing. So in farming, farming's cruel. It's, it's pretty simple. It is a cruel yeah. thing with, with the animals. As I say, it's small profit margin. That's why farm, that, that's why there is intense farming. That's why the family farms died out, which I'm, I'm quite glad around about really in, in a way, uh, because, you know, it, it happened in family farms. It'll happen in big farm. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a sad industry, really, for the animals. There's only one victim in, in the farming industry. Uh, and you might wonder, why, well, why are you on such a small profit margin? Farmers, why were they on such a small profit margin? Well, you took your animals to the auction mart and you'd uh, say your fat lambs, for instance. They'd go to the auction mart. They'd be... The butchers, there's a little section where the, all the butchers stand. Now, I don't mean your family butcher. I mean people who buy for uh, the supermarkets. They buy for people who supply the local high street butchers and people like that. So they all stand around. They determine the price. They look like they're bidding against each other, but they're not. They know the price it can go up to. I've seen them personally look at each other. This is mine. He'll take that at a price that he sets. And you might think, well, why did they set the price so low? So you follow the link one step further back because the supermarkets dictate the prices the butchers have to pay. They're agents for the supermarkets yeah. and for the, the large wholesalers. So it's basically the supermarkets dictate the prices. They're in price wars against each other. You want to pay the lowest price for your beef. Same with dairy. You want to play, pay the lowest price for your milk. Uh, and the supermarkets know that. They're in a price war. They dictate the prices. And that affects, at the end of the line, uh, the victim of all that is the animal. Absolutely. At the, at the end. So that's, that's the bottom line. That, yeah. I, I've been to some auction markets before, and one of the things that I kind of saw a lot was, you know, paddles, you know, the the, um, the auctioneers and the farmers, they would hit the the animals with paddles and shout at them, make noise at them and, and, and force them into to tiny kind of caged off penned areas. Is that kind of sort of thing that, that you would see when you were at the yes, auctions yes. as well? Yes, well, yes. Whilst I was, uh, when I left school at 16, I worked for an auction mart. I worked down some kind of alleys where we had fed them into the, the ring. Now I had to keep up with the auctioneer. That was my job to get the animals in as fast as you could. Uh, but they, they were, I were in the same alley as them. So to, to get one to move, obviously it, it moved backwards. It could kind of crush you if you weren't careful. So we had a stick, we'd whack it if it wouldn't go forward, we'd twist its tail, try and get it going, or stick the stick up its backside if it was a last resort and get it moving. Uh, straight into the ring, we were under pressure to get them cows moving in that ring to keep the flow, because we had hundreds and hundreds of cows to get through. So yeah, that's what happened. Uh, so yeah, it was cruel. It, this cruelty in the auction marts, this cruelty in the farming, this cruelty in the transport of animals. I, I remember in Ro Lord, uh, the the wagon drivers that had come for the animals always had electric prodders, prod get them to go into the wagon because obviously they didn't want to go in a wagon. Why would you want to go in a wagon? Uh, right. But one thing I've noticed in all uh, in all my uh, experience with animal farm animals. 
is that which people really need to know, and I presume most people do know this uh, and are well aware of this, but those animals want to live. Those animals feel compassion. Those animals feel pain and they feel sadness and they feel depression. Uh, you can see, by the way, if, if an animal's in all winter, which they're in, uh, dairy cows in maybe six months of the year, in some cases 12 months of the year, but they're inside uh, just, you know, I mean, in, in back in maybe 20 years ago, a lot of the cows were tied up for six months of the year around the neck in just stalls. They didn't move from there. Uh, the food were brought to them. They slept in that stall. They lived in that stall. Uh, and when you did let them out in uh, in summer into the fields, they'd buck and skip and, and show joy. So I've seen animals looking depressed and getting kind of psychological habits like swaying and messing about, whatever, they, you know, and I've seen them showing joy, skipping and jumping about. And also, again, in the dairy industry, what uh, a cow is has to be kept lactating all the time, you know, to keep it milking. So obviously when it's pregnant, towards the end of the pregnancy, it's what you call dried off. It's stopped milking, its bag dries up. Then it's, then it, uh, when it calves, the calves taken off it. Uh, put in a separate pen. The cows turn maybe back out in the field if it's summer and the cow will go down the field with the other cows for a bit. Then it'll come back up mooing and crying for its calf. This will last for maybe five or six days. It, it'll come up and uh, eventually it'll kind of give up uh, give up hope for, for, for its calf and, and just carry on with the other cows. But it's still thinking about it, it's still worrying because if another cow calves in that field and it could be two, three weeks after the calf's been taken off the, the original cow that's calved. One of its friends, as you might say, it calves. It's mooing around. It goes and tries to mother that calf as well. It wants that calf. It remembers its calf. Uh, it, it loves its calf. And same as we it love a child. Same, right? so it's just the same. And I don't know. Some yeah. people try, don't seem to understand that an animal loves its babies like we love our babies. Why shouldn't it? They're only the same as us. Animals are, all, are only the same as, as us. They might not be as intelligent in they can, they can make things and, you know, master the lives of other animals. I don't know if that's intelligence or just plain stupidity, really. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, what is intelligence? I don't know. Well, this is it. It's, it, it's subjective, but yeah. I guess that the point is that, you know, these animals, what we share in common with them is what is most important you know we are alive we're conscious we feel we can suffer we wish to avoid the feelings of suffering you know we have friends and family um, and, and our life is viewed through you know the very individual experiences that we have it, it's all it's all about perspective really and so as, as you were saying these these cows that they're, they're maternal beings they form like matriarchal herds so it's all about that motherly bond um, and what i guess what 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 you're describing is something that i don't think many people are aware of is the fact that yes all these all these baby calves are taken away from their mothers as soon as they're born because it's not profitable for the farmer to allow the calf to to continue consuming the milk after after the colostrum they they first have and um i guess in the farms the dairy farms that you were working was it artificial insemination or was it more of a it was a all artificial with, insemination with uh, uh the ai mm -hmm. man would come as we called it uh oh it, We'd bring the AI man, choose which bull we wanted. Uh, they'd come. They'd uh, obviously the cow would be tied up in a shed by the neck. The man would go behind it, stick his uh, hand up its uh, up its bottom, uh, and then a straw went up up the vagina. Where so the there must have been a point where his hand met the end of the straw or something, so he knew we were in the right place. Uh, and he the the sperm were frozen nitrogen. Yeah. Liquid nitrogen, sorry. Nitrogen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it'd be frozen right. in that and then squirted in, uh, squirted into the cow. Uh, the cow didn't seem to find that too pleasant, as you can imagine. No. Uh, Did, were but, they restrained then for that to happen? Yes, yeah. They, you, you couldn't just go up to yeah. a cow and do that. It, it was restrained, no. tied by the neck or in a cattle crush or somewhere of convenience where the, the, the AI man was safe. Or lady, of course, the AI person, should I say, because there was a lot of ladies, and I, I always found the ladies did a better job. It, the, probably they had a thinner arm and, and things, and the, yeah. uh, you know, 
they seem to do just as good job as uh, as as a gentleman. If not I better. think it's important to know that that these are these are standard practices you know that that still happen today in fact more prevalent in some cases today because the, the technology has improved in, in terms of ai so th i think that the, the, it's really important to note that the, the artificial insemination the, the separation of the calf from the mother these are just standard practices standard it's, it's standard not something practices. that's exactly it's not a bad practice or an illegal practice it's just it's welfare you know legally condoned welfare practices that, oh, that happen yeah. in all systems of dairy farming yeah yes it's le completely legal to do, yeah, definitely, and it's, uh, it's it happens every day. Which kind of brings me back. Sorry to interrupt you, to you but the, when you you speaking earlier about the, the um the experience with with the lamb who was killed in the field, and also the experience with the cow with the broken leg, I think w w what we can agree on in in those situations is is that kind of behaviour that that was done by by the farmers there isn't necessarily something that would be legally accepted. But do you think was there any consideration for the fact that when the, the lamb was being hit with, with the bar and, and when the cow had the, the leg broken that you know this is something that if someone saw you you know you could get into trouble for doing or was it just kind of ignored because they didn't feel they would well, get into trouble well no no to tell you the truth uh, i mean if someone saw that we we know there'd be some uh repercussions if, if say yeah. you know i mean and no one did see so and we would we wouldn't want anybody to see that but uh, it, it it happened, and we just ignored the the fact that we we did some uh, illegal things. Certainly, what we knew were yeah, were illegal. Is... Uh, also, you you'd know. I mean, going back to the the milk itself, people say to me, uh, "Well, you're vegan. How, how can you how can you live without milk? Well, where do you get your calcium from?" So we explain all the different plants, which I don't have to explain to people where, where you get your calcium from. It's 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 more rife in in vegetables and plants than it is in in milk itself what you do get when you you uh you have a pint of milk or or anything you you're definitely getting some pus or mastitis in your milk that's filtered out but it only filters a certain amount and your milk uh back in the day when i was on on the go it was the mastitis count was like called cell count so you sell if you the lower your cell count, the more you got paid for your milk. Uh, but nobody had a zero cell count. No, nobody. It wasn't. It isn't possible to have a zero cell count. So you're drinking pus when you drink milk. I know it sounds gross, but you are. Also, but it's true. Also, they randomly test the milk. This was back in the day. The milk marketing board. I'll, I'll go back to. They randomly test tested when you your milk. So you knew they'd test one day, but definitely not the day after or the day after. It could be two weeks before the test again, but you knew that. So for a few days, you could put milk that you knew might have penicillin in it into that tank to get paid for that milk as well. You know, it won't be tested. It won't be found out. This would never happened on uh, my father's farm. But one of the farms that I worked at, he'd water his milk down when he knew the test were, were over. I even uh, had a friend whose father, uh, they used to have uh, a dipstick, as you might say, to, to measure the milk in, in them days. Now, I think it's all floor meter. The, all the, the bulk tanks that, that held the milk that were refrigerated to hold the milk, what the milk went into from the cows, uh, they were all leveled up by the milk marketing official. Uh, and so the dip were right. But he used to jack it up. So it made the milk flow back to the dipstick so when they dipped it, it looked like he had more milk they're all there were tricks of the trade to get round things because we wanted more money or you know you've got to make as much as you can uh and so don't think if there are rules out there there are always ways around the rules yeah unless farmers have radically changed and become real animal lovers or and become 100 percent honest uh which I don't know if any of us are. So, you know, I mean, if it's it's down to uh, you know, rules will be bent. You know, yeah. when people are going to come around your farm to inspect it, it's going to look good on that day, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, this is the thing with with things like the red tractor scheme is is that 
these these visits are not unannounced they're not spontaneous so the farmers can prepare they can you know make sure there's no dead animals lying around in, in the pens yeah. or in the sheds they can make sure that all of their wall charts are in place and and so th- it's 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 a ridiculous system because there's really no accountability whatsoever and we talk about um you were talking about like about if farmers have changed but i guess part of the problem is if if, if you take a child who's raised in in a farming situation they're going to pick up all those behavioral traits and those um kind of shortcuts and those ideas off, off their family and if there's no accountability and they never get into see their parents get into trouble for it then they're probably just going to adopt those exact same behaviors or at least have that same mentality yeah it's, it's like like a, uh, i've said before Eddie, it's it's a way of life i remember uh my dad in spring when the birds were nesting the magpies would make the nest he'd send me up he'd wait till he felt there were eggs in there or there was uh chicks in there he'd send me up to that nest and make me throw the chicks out uh at the magpies nest because the magpies pinched some of the eggs what he he had so yeah uh we had a big we we also sold eggs as well but because we didn't do it properly commercially it was just a few eggs for herself yeah. and sell one or two to you know at the end of the end of the road we lived at the end of a very busy uh yeah road so and did you buy them from hatcheries did you did you buy them from from like certified hatcheries he and... breed his own he had an incubator an incubator and he'd okay. uh he'd hatch his own bring them up uh and and that and that was that way he kept the cockerels he'd bring them them up to a certain age and then he'd, he'd ring the neck and we'd eat them for for sunday lunch I've, I've been to free range houses of modern times now and to be free range you've got to understand they've just got the opportunity to go out but the food's inside i'd say 98 well 98 percent. that's just a guess so don't quote me on that but 98 percent of the ends will stay in of the thousands that are in that that building 98 percent will stay and you'll get a few that just go out and it'll always be the same ones that go out and it's always the same ones that stay in you know free range you might as well forget that they still got the same food in there as the battery ends they fed the same food as the battery ends fed so you still you're not getting good eggs I've heard, you know you might think oh i love these eggs they're lovely orange yolks why are they orange i don't know because it's dyeing the food maybe that makes them orange because that's what people want they don't want the pale yellow eggs that go green when you boil them. They want the uh, they want the orange ones. And how do you get orange eggs? You put something in the food that makes the eggs orange. Wow, I wasn't aware of that. See, this is another thing, isn't it? We're, we're, we're not told the truth. And there are so many little tricks from the industries to make us you know, feel more comfortable buying those products and to make it more palatable to us. And something like changing the color of the oaks is... Um, it's, it's very interesting. Trying to dictate it, what they want, don't we, Ed? You know, we, yeah. we say what they want. We like our eggs orange if we eat eggs, which we obviously mean you don't. But, you know, they want, the customer wants their eggs a nice orange short. Yeah. And so going back to, to the going back to when you were working on, on the dairy, um, we, we, we kind of established the point where the, the, the calf is separated from the mother and, and the mother will mourn for the, for the loss of her child. Yes. What, what would happen with the, the, ma- the male calves in the industry? The male calves, well... Back in my day, there was a very good trade, trade for veal. A lot of the calves were exported out of Britain, uh, and that put the price up. So you might be getting, I'm talking like early 90s, you might be getting £350 for a Belgian blue bull calf. Uh, the Frisian bull ones were also sold for veal, but they wouldn't make as much. Uh, they'd be down at like £80, £90. But if you had a good Belgian blue or a good limousine, they were making up to £350 if they were kept for maybe three, four weeks, you know, a month at top, something like that, so take them to the auction, then they'd be shipped off somewhere uh, for veal. Well, what, what happened with the veal trade then? Why did it Why did it become such a... Well, why did we stop doing that, I guess, well, is the question. I'm not sure. I mean, I think we were... I'm not sure what country were uh, ship it that, that were buying our, our stuff for veal. I'm not sure whether it were France or... Or somewhere like that, but I can't Probably. don't quote me on that. Yeah. But it was some country, and they just stopped. They must have started having enough. We just were going through a good time for. Them. I think they still go for veal, uh, and we may export a few, but the export went down. So I'm not hundred percent sure what the calf trade is like now. But some will obviously still go for for veal. Yep, some are still exported. I think yeah. France, as you say, is one of the countries. Um, 
but uh, I guess because we've moved away from from veal, even the exporting of calves for veal in other countries, did you, did you sell some of the calves to become um, into the beef herd, so to speak? Yes, yeah, yes. A lot of the bull calves went to be beef herds. For, for example, for six months I worked uh, over the winter period, I worked on what was known as a barley beef farm where young bull calves uh, or sturks maybe were brought, were, well, they were calves really, were brought into a, a big building. They were fed barley all the time, which fattened them quick. They were in a big building on slats, a slatted floor, so there were no bedding because you can't have bedding okay. on a slatted floor. The poo and the wee's got to fall through into a big pit underneath. But the problem we found on that farm, and there were a lot of deaths on that particular farm, because it, it, the cold air coming up all the time, we couldn't keep, they were getting pneumonia all the time. Uh, we had bottles of penicillin, just what the vets let us have, and we were injecting uh, anything that were looking poorly, we kept getting injected, so we had a lot of deaths, uh, and we just dragged them out of the, uh, the building, stick them in a, a, a building until we piled a lot of carcasses up. Uh, and they were, again, someone came to collect those uh, eventually, after, but they didn't half smell for a while. So they were just left in the... They were, they were, they were dragged the out to the, 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 animal, the pens with the animals uh, and just left in a, a, like a, a barn and just left okay. there until we got enough and then send the wagon load of them away to get rid of them. I don't know where they got rid of them. They probably went for... Something I don't know. They got rid of the carcasses in them days. Uh, I didn't look into. I didn't even think about it. You know, I, I, I was just busy doing me uh, me work. Uh, and on that mm -hmm. one, they were just fed and they got fat quick. And so by eight months old, they were in the beef. They they were sold as beef, not as veal or anything. At eight month old, that was just proper beef. You'd be eating barley beef, which was uh, quite meant to be quite succulent sort of meat. So that that's what uh, the barley beef system was, but. Uh, on that particular farm, we lost so many of them because there were so many in the pens. It was split up in pens, all on slatted floors, and the coat, it was just too cold for them. There were no yeah. bedding, no bedding at all. And it's not bad. Some animals do better without bedding uh, as long as they're cleaned out all the time. They do fine without bedding as long as you clean them out all the time. Uh, but because they've, they've got a warm sort of, floor the the body eat warms the floor they couldn't eat that slatted floor up because of the draft that were coming up so they just got pneumonia and and died lots of them wow so how many how many are we talk how many are we talking what what sort of numbers well the you, building would probably mean? hold about 90 animals and i'd say 35 of them that 90 would go but we kept of course they were restocked and new ones kept going in we in, well, in we must have had a stack of about 35 animals at the end of the six month period that i worked there uh and then i left wow uh, so that particular job it was it was a constant a yeah. constant turnover where they would where they would they would die and they'd be taken and then stacked up and waited for the um wait to be collected to be disposed of yeah, because he, he had different buildings with, with, with younger ones in that weren't quite ready to go into the, the barley beef unit. I mean, obviously yeah. that's just a, a one-off thing. Some some systems will have been better than that. Some will have been worse. But the eight months of life just stuck in a building, I don't think that's very fair. They wouldn't choose it. Uh, it's forced upon them. Is that well, like nothing even even in a, even in a system that isn't as horrific to them in that moment they, they still wouldn't choose that if they had that choice isn't it we strip them of their ability to to make well not even to make choices but to strip them of their life when when we used to going back to my family farm uh, what uh what, they were tied up by the neck for six months when you let them out the joy the skipping about the, it, it was nice to see it was really nice to see yeah. them jumping and skipping about and that's showing an emotion isn't it surely Absolutely, happiness, joy. Yeah, uh, a couple of um, studies, I guess, well, not studies, but uh, some statistics have come out. I think last year that that was saying that in this country we kill about 
I think something around like 90,000 or 100,000 male dairy calves as soon as they're born. Was there anything, did you see anything like that on, on the farms that you, you were raised in or worked on where the dairy calves that weren't exported for veal or, or, or weren't raised for veal, were they ever just killed on the farm? Not intentionally, but uh, I remember, no, because they were worth money. They were all worth money when I were farming. There was a trade for them. There was always a trade for them. Now, I can understand, I've, I've heard the tale people killing uh, the calves when they're born because they're worth nothing. I've definitely heard that. And I've also heard that with the horse trade at the moment being very, very low. There's a lot of people whose horses, they're not even, they're making £20 in the, in the auction mark. The passport's more than that. You have to have a passport for an horse and a microchip. It's costing yep. more than that. So instead of microchipping them, passporting them, and then losing money on them, they've killed them. Uh, yeah. There and then they shot them. Shoot them or something. Shot them. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've heard, I've heard that, uh, uh, and I know that to be true. But I, I'm, yeah. you know, that's uh, that's a definite. Well, I guess it's things like the with with the calves as opposed to the horse. I guess with things like you know, the the foot and mouth disease crisis, um, and then obviously with, with with veal and stuff, it it really just kind of decimated that industry to the point now where you know male dairy calves if then if they can't necessarily be raised for beef if they're not the right breed or you know they don't fit the criteria and you know when we with the export you know with live exports being such a uh, a moral issue even even if you're not vegan now it's it's become so so difficult for farmers to i guess to to make money from 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 the male calves which i think is probably leading to this increasing or at least the existence of, of male calves being being shot or, or killed or you know or sent to the slaughterhouse pretty much as soon as they're born just just to save money yes yeah i, I can believe that's a hundred percent true i can believe i can believe it's yeah you know if if I, i've never I, I, like i said i'm only going to tell the truth so i've never actually witnessed anybody yeah killing calves when they're born but I, yeah. it, it wouldn't surprise me it wouldn't surprise no. me at all because if they're not, if they, if you're going to lose money doing something, why do it? You wouldn't do it. It's, you know, it's not. And farmers don't. The farm for the for the love of farmer. It's it's uh, it's a way of life. They go to, you know, you're a young man, a young child, maybe going to young farmers clubs, and you mix in with other farmers, and you know, it's it's a lot of uh, you take your animals to shows and young farmers shows and things like that, and you. You're in the community. You're you're part of a community, and it's. It, I suppose that's a nice part of uh, farming. I never liked going to young farmers clubs. I thought everybody was it. Who's got the biggest tractor and who's got the most cows and all a bit braggy and things like that. Uh, it weren't my cup of tea, so I never really went. And like I say, when no. I was twenty-one, I got out of the, the game altogether. If because I'm I'm intrigued by kind of going through all the different bits of of dairy that. I'm familiar with and just just kind of verifying them with your experiences and so one of the other things that you know I've um not personally witnessed but I've seen I've seen footage of and, and seen animals who have had done to them is 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 disbudding and, and dehorning and was, was that a practice that that your the family yes was that was a regular well? practice that was a, a, a very regular practice I was the the chief uh calf holder in those days and we'd have a fire with a debudding iron. I mean, you get electronic ones now, which eat up on their own, but we eat it ours up in the fire because we're probably a bit old fashioned up to some farms. And it got, when you got it glowing red hot, it was like a, it looked like a copper sort of end on it or brass. I can't remember which one it was. It was obviously got charred, but I know it was some heat absorbing metal. But you get it red hot uh, and then you just burn them off. And I, I used to hold the calves as they were, the buds were burnt off. And that, of course, he suffered pain. Of course, he was sore and you put some ointment on him after. Uh, and the, there was no anaesthetic and that was common practice. But that was in some ways lucky for them, uh, up to some animals who, uh, who missed the system and they maybe would buy something that had horns on. Uh, and that was putting an elter on those cows with the horns that we wanted to remove horns because horns were quite dangerous when you were walking past the cows. You could uh, stab you with them accidentally, obviously not on purpose. So that was a matter of getting something what I can only describe as like a, a wire, cheese wire, 
with two handles, one on either side. We'd strap the cow up as tight as we could. I'd be helping hold, holding the cow and the horns were sawn off like uh, very fast. The idea of it was to do it as fast as you could so it, it got hot as well, so it was meant to seal uh, the horns. But the cow was in so much pain, it jerked around, you'd have to stop. It was dangerous, the horns were getting, you know, you'd get jabbed a few times with the horns. It was dangerous for the people, very painful for the cow or the bull, whichever one you were doing. And of course, it never did seal it. There were blood everywhere. You'd have to... Uh, I remember one old farmer I was doing it for, he used to grab cobwebs from the building he was in after he'd done it and put the cobwebs on, on the stubs of the horn and say, that'll absorb the, the blood and make it clot. Uh, there was so much blood and it did, but I just thought cobwebs, really. But anyway, that's what he did. That, that was his way. And when and when those things were happening, what what were your if you can remember? I know it was a little while ago, but what, kind of what were your f thoughts about about it? Did you think it was wrong? Did did it make you upset, or or did you just well, think that this was something that had to be done? If you remember, going, I'd be maybe fifteen, sixteen. Uh, I'd been brought up a a tough sort of of lad, ardent to the the things of farming. If you're used to it, it was just an everyday thing. I I didn't feel anything uh, about it. No, I felt. Nothing really much for the for the animal in that case because it would just this had happened a few times a year with, with the the big ones and it, almost a, you know every week with a with a little calf bud so I didn't really think anything of it uh, because I'd seen it I've seen it all before so but now I look back and I feel you know it's my duty really to be I'll never pay back the things that I've particularly been part of with, with animals. If I'm vegan for the rest of my life and another lifetime beyond, you can't pay back the the things that you've done. But hopefully by, this is one of the reasons I'm on saying this, Ed, and telling people about this, is maybe it might help somebody else become uh, vegan. It might actually just, you know, it might be a bit of me trying to pay back what I've, you know, what I've been part of in my early life and, and done. Uh, and there, there were some horrible things. I, I, I was working on a, I got a, a Saturday job as a young man on a, a, a farm as well because I wanted to earn a bit of pocket money as well because we in the farming community, everything's about money. Uh, you're not anything if you don't have a bit of money. So I wanted to start earning my own money in them days as, as, as a young man a young boy, maybe still at school. So on Saturdays, I'd go to this local farm and feed his calves. And another boy who'd left school, he was a bigger boy than me. And as uh, as rough as rats, as you might say, he was tough. I didn't say anything to this lad. And he used to, we, we used to feed the calves milk after we took off the mum. So they'd suck your fingers and they'd know, they had lovely, soft, squidgy noses. Uh, they were quite nice. Uh, he used to box them. He, he, he were like, he used to punch. He used to have a boxing match with the with the calves in a way. This one particular calf, I remember, and he'd he'd punch it in the nose a few times as it kept, and it keep poor little thing would keep coming because uh, it wanted to suck his fingers and he'd whack it again. And I remember eventually, the teeth of the calf, his mouth became so, and the teeth came out, and eventually that calf died. And the the guy who owned the calf, he. He couldn't work out what what has gone wrong with this calf. He didn't he didn't know about this was happening. He couldn't understand why the calf was sore and it lost the tooth and it he never accused me or the other boy or anything. But I I thought that was, I remember thinking that is so cruel. I wanted to kick his head in, but he was far bigger than me. Uh, I hated him for that, and uh, I don't know what's become of him because I, I'm uh, you know I'm not in contact with that guy anymore. And I didn't see him after I left that job, but I was there for two years. Uh, and that used to go on. But I just remember that particular one, and that's another thing why I'm, I, I want that, you know, I feel I could have done something. I could have told the farmer, and I'd like to, you know, I should have done, but I was too scared to. Uh, and really, that's another reason why I'm talking to you, Ed. I think I need to pay back, uh, you know, to the animals, if if just one person, after hearing my little speech, turns vegan, stops, 
you know, just eat, eat, just stops eating meat and dairy. Absolutely, and I, I think, and I think this, I think I'm really um, so incredibly grateful for you sharing those stories because I, I, they are horrible stories, and and I and I and I, from what you've expressed, I imagine that, that you, you from. From what you've expressed about trying to maybe repay off some some of that guilt and some some of the things that that you feel that maybe you, you were involved in even if you personally didn't do them, I think it's important to mention that just it's it's not just about being actively involved in in the farming process. Even when we buy these products, we're still responsible for animals suffering and dying. And even if we don't know about all of these other stories that maybe you're talking about, some of the which are standard practice and some of which are, are not standard practice, but but do happen on, on certain farms, we still have to understand that we we bear responsibility as consumers and and i feel like part of what i do as well is 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 also part of that that process of trying to repay off that that debt of you know the suffering that, that we were personally responsible for and so i don't i don't want you to feel for a second that you somehow have more of a debt to pay because that was the way you were raised those were the farms you were brought up in that was what you were um around and the experiences that, that you had to have from a very young age and so I don't hold you and I don't think anyone should ever hold farmers as being any more personally responsible for the system. Yes, the individual pockets of things that happen, but the systematic violence is something we all bear, you know, collectively as a species of consumers, I think. I, was, I think that's important to mention, but I, I am very grateful for you, for you sharing those stories. And so I kind of kind of maybe want to continue through that through that process. And so we've talked about cows have you know been disputed and dehorned and uh, and the horrible things that happened to them at that point and, and, and i guess the milking process is it's fairly straightforward you know they're, they're taken to milking parlors what maybe two three times a day w would that be about right uh yes yeah, yeah usually twice a day sometimes three times a day uh i mean the a lot of the milking parlors uh now the cows come in on their own almost and, and they they almost milked on their own with one one man just supervising it now you might think, well, cows must enjoy being milked because they'll come up to the field and they'll come up to the gate sometimes at milking time ready to be milked. It's only because they've got so much milk in them that it's so uncomfortable. They need to, and also they get uh, what we call proving some food whilst they're being milked. So it's two incentives for them to come in. They get the food, uh, a bit of food that they like to help them, make, to give them more food and relax them to let them let the milk down. Uh, and also it relieves a uh, swollen uh, udders, which, uh, you know, some cows uh, back in going 20 years ago, six or seven gallons was uh, was a lot of milk for a cow to give. That's that's probably just average now, below average, maybe in some cases. Uh, cows are giving a lot more milk per day uh, than, than six gallon, probably more like eight gallon nowadays with the, uh, you know, perfecting the breed of cow. You know, Holsteins give more milk. They're, they're a little bit more susceptible to uh, disease and, and things like that. Yeah, and, and this is an important point. I hear farmers say a lot, oh, I know the cows walk to the parlours themselves so that, so they enjoy it, they, they look forward to it. But as you say, it, you know, this isn't what they would want in an ideal situation. You know, as you, they've been selectively bred to produce huge quantities of milk, far more than they ever would naturally. And so they need to be milked and, and that doesn't make it ethical to do so. It just shows the extent to which we've exploited them and, and used them for our, own, for our own personal gain. So yes, they may sometimes walk themselves to the parlour, but that's not because they are willing participants in their own exploitation they're just trying to do what they can to relieve you know the pain or, 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 you know of, of that feeling of, of needing to be milked it's 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 a twisted mindset to, to then claim that it to much justifies the industry it just further reinforces how victimized these animals are to the fact where they're, they're almost willingly taking part in that exploitation just to try and relieve one element of, of the suffering yeah that that's basically what why they come up to the gate to, to be milked they, they get a bit of food and also it relieves the the others. I mean, uh, the, you've got to, just to change the subject slightly, animals yeah. are quite hard to work with because you can't say, oh, there's it, I would like you to just go over there and just stand in that pen there just for a minute, uh, if you wouldn't mind. It'd be nice if you could and they'd just go over there, but they don't know what you, they are not sure what you want them to do when they're in, uh, surroundings that they're not used to. So uh, if they don't go, 
they get it with sticks and made to go. And if they still don't want to go, if you, say at the auction mart, for instance, please, would you go in back of that cattle truck there? We want to transport you somewhere. Uh, we're not telling you where because you won't like if you get there. You can't say that to a cow. You've got to make them go in. So it's electric prods or sticks or, or twisting tails, which usually breaks them to get them to go in. Uh, so you've got to, you know, and it's, they're, they're hard work. It's stressful on the, the, the guy who's loading the cows up. It's hard work for them. So the temper kicks in a little bit in there and it's uh, gritting your teeth and getting that cow in there by any means because it's a cow, but you wouldn't do it to your dog or cat. And that's what, you know, when people say, oh, yeah, we're animal lovers. You've probably heard this a million times. Uh, you know, you're not an animal lover if you eat meat. You're, you're actually quite the opposite because you're condoning what goes on just for you to enjoy the taste of something. It doesn't seem, uh, doesn't seem right. And I won't, you know, I'm, I'm opting out of, I've opted out of that. I, don't, I will never go back to meat. I'll never go back to, uh, to working on farms. You touched on a really interesting thing, which was, um, about how, you know, often farmers have dogs and, you know, you use the Jack Russell example. And it's, it's interesting because I've been to quite a few slot houses and I, I see this a lot in England or in the UK in general is you have a farmer, he'll pull up in his Land Rover or his Jeep and he'll have a trailer attached in the trailer. There could be sheep or, or pigs or, or cows. But then in the passenger seat sat next to him is, is a, a Jack Russell or, or, or just any <laughs> yeah. type of dog. And yeah. he'll pull, he'll pull the, 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 the trailer into the yard of the slaughterhouse. He'll, as you say, force the animals out of the, the trailer and into the holding pens where, where they sit waiting to be slaughtered. And then he'll get back in his, his Jeep or Land Rover and he'll drive off with, with the dog still there. And it's just yeah. a complete disconnect between this animal the, the, who he loves and you say sits by the fire and he pets and, you know, it has, it goes on, on long walks and probably cherishes a family member, but he's sending animals who, who are identical in all the ways that matter to the animal that he loves to a horrible violent death that there's such a, a massive disconnection in the farming world well there is and what you've got to understand that uh, as I, I pointed out in the in the uh in at the start it's a matter of pounds and pence and animals are assets they're not animals farm animals are assets they're not animals you've got to forget thinking that farm animals are animals if you want to get into the farmer's mentality they're not farmers aren't uh um you know they paint the picture like farmers are cruel, nasty people. They're not. They love their animals. They love the children. They love their wives. They love their husbands. They love, uh, you know, they love just the same as me and you. They care about people. Just they, They'll watch a film on telly and cry just the same as me and you. They're just normal people who have disconnect, completely disconnected from an, farm animals, their animals, being animals. It's money to them and they have to make a living and that's what it is and that's why it's so wrong and that's why cruelty happens because they're not really animals to them. I'm not saying that's every, every farmer in the world. You can't speak for every farmer, but the ones that I've been involved with and the ones that I still know and are related to, they're not animals. They're assets. No, they're assets. I think that's powerful. It's as simple as that. And I know there's a lot, a lot of people who, who, uh, who's heard stories like they've seen things like Cowspiracy and Land of Open Glory are yours, Ed, and things like that. And I'll go out and think, right, I'm going to do something about it. And I've heard tales of going out, letting animals out of the fields and stuff like that. That's not really going to help. That's just going to cause the animal more stress, opening gates, letting, letting them out of fields. It's, I can understand why people have done it, but it's not going to get the animals. It's just going to cause them more danger to them, to the animal, danger to the public on the roads, danger to themselves. Uh, and just stress for the animal getting back in. The most effective thing that I've come across, uh, I was in, I'd, I'd come up, on, up up to Leeds on holiday and I was going through Leeds and I saw some young people with a, the masks on, uh, voices for the those who can't, what I don't, can't remember what they call themselves with a little oh, video yeah. screen. Anonymous for the voiceless. That's, that's the one. Uh, and I, I, I watched people. I, I'm a bit of a people watcher. And me and my wife sat there and watched them for a while. And I saw people actually in tears after watching it, young girls uh, walking away in tears watching that. I think, that, and I thought, well, that is reaching people. That's 
you know, that's one way of reaching people. Uh, something like that. Just educating people. Well, I agree. It's all about education. It's all about just showing people what happens. And uh, and part of what we're doing now is talking about what happens. Just It's all about educating. And with, with that knowledge comes that kind of power to be able to take control of your actions and you can empower one another to make more conscious and ethical actions by simply just showing people what they're responsible f- for causing and I, you, you, we talked a lot about dairy and um uh, just w- one final question about dairy is, is at what kind of age would would the normal dairy cow be taken to the slaughterhouses it could be any age they could get they get mastitis a lot because they're producing so much milk uh, and so they'll lose uh, a quarter and become Three quartered one or a three papped, and as some some people say, so one of its paps gets full of mastitis, gets sore and hard. You can't milk that one, so you'd bung, put a bung in one of the clusters that go on. And you'd milk its three, but then you wouldn't bull that cow again. You wouldn't get that cow impregnate that cow again. That cow would go to the to the slaughterhouse. Uh, it it would go for uh, in my day it would go for meat. Yeah, you know, you wouldn't get that if you. you You'd be putting penicillin in it, trying to mend it. Uh, you'd squirt a penicillin tube of penicillin up its uh, up its teat, and that'd try and help the quarter. But if that didn't work, if it weren't producing milk on that quarter, you would not re uh, impregnate that cow. That would go for for meat. So that could be. Some people wait till the cow's three before they they impregnate it for the first time. Some people do it at two year old, for the first time. Uh, and you try and use a small bull, like an Angus bull or something. You'd bull it with an Angus bull. It'd have it produce a small beef calf, but then that cow's in the milking system. Uh, and then that'll stay for the rest of its life until maybe six, seven years old. If if a good, a lucky cow could live six or seven years before it's uh, before it's out of the system. So I'll be milking for for years maybe right. and and with the with the sheep with the sheep that that you um that you raised as well or, or were raised on the farms that you worked on what was the kind of standard practices for sheep were they, were they artificially inseminated or were they impregnated no 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 they, they, they'd have a you put a ram in with them or a top yeah uh and you'd mark put some wax on the on the the top so you could see when it had mated with a sheep so you'd start with a yellow marker so it, it would go around and uh, tup all the sheep, as you might say, uh, and then if they eld, if they be, if they be, remain pregnant, then they would just stay on a yellow mark. Then two weeks after, you'd mark it with a, a blue, and so if they came back over, if they came uh, in season again after two weeks, you'd the blue mark would be on, or the red, or whatever, and you'd go up in colours, and then you knew when that sheep that sheep would due. I mean, sheep would have uh, lambs all year round. If the tup was kept in all all year round, but they don't they, they aim for the early. So some people will go early. Some people will want the sheep to lamb in January, February, so they can get the lambs into the auction early in May, maybe May June, April May June. Some people get the lambs as early in as as that, and they get the better money. Then from like late June on to oh on towards Christmas and lambs will be going in and they won't make as much money. Some people will save them till January, February the next year and sell them then and they'll be get the more get more money then again and they'll be still classed as lamb even though they're a year old. Well not quite a year old, you know, they're still under a year. They haven't got their teeth. Get some different teeth when they get to a certain age. And then they're not classed as lamb. So that's mutton then? Yeah, probably. Yeah. But yeah. then also you'd impreg some people uh, a lamb could be born in, say, say March, and they might be pregnant. Uh, some of the breeding, what if they meant for breeding, they could be pregnant in November, December, the next, the same year. In some cases, and they'll probably just have a single lamb. Uh, some people don't uh, impregnate them so quickly. They'll wait till the year after. And you get a lot of problems with those not being very good mothers for a start, uh, dying in uh, in birth because they're just too young, too young at uh, at that age. But people still do them. And when the the, the when they use a, 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 a impregnated to 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 give birth in in 
the winter months, January and February, because lambs are, are actually the naturally they would they would lamb in um in the warm ups in spring so talking April time. Yeah. But the farmers, as you were saying, they, they they breed them to produce the babies a couple of months early. So the winter time, but that causes a whole host of, of problems because, you know, sheep traditionally are allowed to lamb in the fields and they do get to graze throughout most of the year. If, if sometimes in I think all of the year, but because they're they they they're bred to give birth so early in the winter there's a huge infant mortality rate within huge. the lamb industry. And I think I saw a yeah. figure I think it said between 10 and 25%. I think 25 is obviously pushing it, but we're looking in, in the millions in the UK every year, you know, of yes. lambs dying because they're bred too early. Was that something that you saw at all? Definitely, 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 definitely. And and also overstocking of the fields. The, uh, the, the sheep, whilst being pregnant, probably about this time of year, if they're due in March, can start having what they call twin lamb disease. They don't get enough nutrients in them. And the sheep will just, uh, they'll, it affects the mind and everything. And the, the sheep just kind of dies eventually with twin lamb disease if you don't treat it straight away. And that's just because they've got, they're feeding the lambs too much uh, inside them and they're not getting enough food in them. And I've seen a lot of death of sheep through, through twin, what might be known as twin lamb disease to some people. There's obviously other names for it, but that's what we knew it as. And also, yeah, there were loads of lambs uh, died, born dead, died within the first few weeks because uh, of the cold, uh, a lot of sheep prolapsing this time of year because they're too heavy in lamb, they've been fed too much. So the lambs have got too big and they prolapse. Uh, and so you, there's a special device that you could tie into the wool and shove up the vagina to hold everything in place there. It's very uncomfortable, I, I presume, for the sheep. Uh, but it holds them in until lambing time, and then maybe you wouldn't impregnate that sheep again if you had any sense, because it's only just going to prolapse again next year, probably, once it's pro prolapsed. So they'd go for the slaughter then uh, God, after, after so, lambing, yeah. if they've managed to bring a lamb up. But of course, uh, one of the practices we, we used to do, if... if if we had a, a, a sheep lamb twins, but one of them were dead, and we had a sheep that lamb triplets, we'd take one of the triplets off them, we'd skin the dead lamb, put the skin on the lamb we took off the triplets, so it smelt like its own lamb. We'd put that in a pen uh, to walk around with its mother with its dead lamb's skin on it, so it smelt like its, its own child, as you might say, its own lamb. Uh, and then once it started drinking its milk for a few, a few days it starts to smell like its mother and the mother accepts it to get it to accept it mothers don't, don't wouldn't accept another sheep's lamb by choice you've got to fool them into accepting them and, and so you'd have just to make it even so so one lamb isn't struggling one sheep isn't struggling with three lambs trying to feed them and one's having an easy ride with with two uh they both have it you'd make him so they both yeah ideally all your sheep should have well, you'd like them to have two lambs on them and not three or not one. Uh, so that that's one practice. It, it seems a bit uh, strange to some people skinning a lamb and putting it on, but it, I suppose it worked. Uh, I don't suppose it was too pleasant for the lamb, but... Uh, no. There you go. I, I've, never, I've never heard of that before. That's, have you not? No, I, that I, was a very common practice. No. Wow. No. Okay, that's absolutely crazy, isn't it? Oh my goodness, that's yeah. Well, you wouldn't uh, do it to a wow, child, I, would you? I, you know, you wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> could you imagine doing that? No. You couldn't imagine it. Hopefully, it's like some. It's just it's something from a horror movie to think of that happening. Like, <laughs> oh wow! No, I'm, I'm it is. But it, I, 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 I know that. I'm laughing, uh, Ed. But it, I'm only laughing because it's. If you said that to a farmer, they'd say, "Oh yeah, I've heard of that," and they think nothing of it. You know, they'd be yeah. like, "Oh yeah." Yeah, but like you're you're saying, relating it to an horror movie, it's that that's the yeah. difference in in mentalities, and uh, uh, you know that's why they're they're just an asset, or the animals not yeah. uh, they're just money, walking and the money. lambs are that they're they're um they're mutilated as well. They have their their tails taken off as as well, don't? Yes, through, yeah, through they, elastic, they have their tails bands. usually rubber ring. On the tails yep. and on the testicles. Now, you might think, oh, well, rubber rings, oh, that sounds all right. It shouldn't hurt too much. Well, it does. 
It does hurt, because you put them on the testicles and the lambs will spend maybe three or four hours rolling around the floor. Get, they will get up, walk about, follow the mum a bit, then roll around the floor again until, the pain, the, until it must just go numb. Eventually, it goes numb. Uh, and the tails must go numb, and eventually the tails drop off, and eventually the testicles start to grow and drops off. And uh, there you go. But that uh, the hurts putting rubber rings on it. Whatever uh, anybody says, oh, no, it's a very humane w way of uh, of castrating. It's not. It's not humane at all. It hurts. I've seen it. Uh, yeah. And also, from time to time, one gets, gets missed. I've seen... Uh, I've seen people just uh, spot one of the lambs that's tails have been missed and just quickly, as quick as a flash, just cut it off, as, grab the lamb's tail and just cut it and cut it off and just, the lamb's just left bleeding. But the, these things happen. That, that's illegal to cut the lamb's tail off with a knife. The rubber ring yeah. isn't. I don't, know which is, uh, I don't know which is more painful for the lamb. Well, I mean, it, 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 that's actually an interesting question because I think for anyone who's maybe doubtful of, because I hear this a lot, oh, you know, the, the elastic band or the rubber ring method, it, it doesn't cause lambs pain. But if you take, like, say, a rubber ring and you tie it really tightly around your finger, th your finger starts to throb and then it'll start to hurt. I mean, of course it's, uh, of course it's going to hurt. It's, it's causing a trophy, so complete, uh, cutting off the blood supply to those parts of the body until they rot and fall off. It's. It it in a weird way it it seems to be one of the cruelest ways of doing that you know it's just, well yeah and think, it, it, it it is Ed it is I mean uh, it's all right you know it would hurt your finger try putting it around your testicles that's gonna hurt a heck of a lot right, more right right <laughs> you know yes. it's gonna hurt a lot more it's cruel it's as simple as yeah. that rubber rings are cruel uh, to the animals uh, doing anything to an animal that doesn't want doing to it is is cruel it's it, bullying it's mean isn't it uh, and that's what happens to farm animals because there's nothing we do to farm animals that they would want us to do i can't think of one instant on, on a farm that apart from taking them food and water and they certainly don't want the no. empty vac injection that sheep get uh twice a year and it remains in their system even uh my father an ardent farmer does not eat anything to do with sheep he won't have lamb, he won't have mutton, because he believes that the, the things that they're injected with are still in the system, and he doesn't want it in his. Uh, and so the farmer doesn't want to eat the, the meat? My father doesn't. Wow, so, so e even though he sells it to other people to, to eat, he because he knows a little bit about what goes in, well, he knows everything that goes into it, it he doesn't want to do that. No, He's no, he, he doesn't want to do that, and... Uh, I mean, he'd be very disappointed when he, if he hears that I've talked to you, Ed. But uh, you know, even him, he, him himself would uh, have to admit that everything that I have told you today is completely true. It's completely yeah. true. I'm being 100% honest. I've nothing against farmers. I'm just like, uh, you know, I don't eat meat. I don't have any dairy products. Uh, because I know what the, who, who's a victim. There's victims yep. uh, from that industry, and there probably is victims in lots of industries, but particularly the farming is industry. There's victims, and it's not just uh, you know they're they're victims because of the pain and the cruelty and everything that they have to endure on a day to day yep. basis. Well. I mean, we've been we've been speaking for 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 a while, and and a lot of the stuff we've been speaking about is is, is quite heavy. So I I don't want to press you too much on on, on other things now. But I think it, a nice way to end, considering we've talked about a lot of these really challenging things and experiences that you've 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 been a part of, would be to kind of talk about well, what compelled you to to become vegan then? What was it the farming? Was it just more, as we said before, awareness and learning about different aspects of, of what happens to animals? Or what kind of brought you to the point from being a part of the the, the situation where calves were being you know, punched in the face, where lambs were being killed with bars, where you know cows' legs were broken, these really horrible situations. What brought you from, from that world into the world of, of being a vegan? Well, as to what brought me into being a uh, vegan, Ed, is because I got out of, I got out of agriculture at about 21, 22, 
uh, I went to a different business where I mixed with different people, you know, uh, gen just ordinary people who aren't farmers. Not saying farmers aren't ordinary, but they are people who are not in the farming way of life because it is a way of life. Uh, and they're immune to the things that they see. They're immune to it. The horrors that they see, it's not horrors to them, to us it is. And I started mixing with them, those sort of people and I started seeing that everything in far, that, that it's wrong to treat animals like that. I've got pets of my own now uh, who come and sit on my knee on a night and I give them a cuddle. Uh, shouldn't every animal have, have the right to be treated kindly? And I've just never met a farm animal that's been treated kindly, you know. And that propelled, that, that changed the way I thought. And uh, after a while, I went to vegetarian. I've been vegetarian for a lot of years. Uh, and then I watched Cowspiracy one day, uh, which, you know, I just thought, well, all this is true. Uh, and there were a bit of a, something sign up to be a vegan for a year, and that was several years ago. So I signed up, and I've never gone back. And it's so easy to be a vegan. I'm fitter, I'm stronger, of uh, than I was in my twenties, and I'm now I'm fifty tomorrow actually. Uh, oh, wow, that's I'm still, amazing. I'm still as uh, I, there's nothing with my three years of being vegan or more. Uh, there's nothing that's gone wrong my, my health has improved even from being vegetarian to vegan uh, I feel like I've uh, even my I, I don't know I feel almost like I can think uh, faster and better and be more efficient with the work that I do nowadays so Good for you. Uh, that's what's really changed me my, being vegan changed my life in a lot of ways a lot of ways yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories and your experiences. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, as you say, to, to come onto the podcast and to, to describe some of those things that, that, that you witnessed. And, um, and for everyone who's listening, um, you know, thank you for listening throughout the podcast. And, you know, I appreciate some of those details. We're not, we're not pleasant to listen to. But, but Mark, I just want to say thank you so much again. And um, I really am so incredibly grateful for this opportunity and for you having you know the want and the desire to to educate people and to spread awareness and just shed light on, on some of the darkness in an industry that, that likes to conceal what happens um you know to these animals that they that they exploit so thank you thank you so much mark no it's it's been a pleasure ed and, I, and uh, i'd also like to return that back to you really thank you for the things that you're, you're doing the awareness that you're uh the the help the help that you're giving animals really i think it's a very good thing so thank you for that well, that's very kind of you. I, I appreciate that. All right, Mark, well, we'll keep in touch with each other and um, I appreciate everything today.